today's top story from the perspective of someone who's there. You are looking live. This just in. Not my beat. Of course, Sam is the commander's beat reporter for the Washington Post. Uh, Mr. Fortier, how are you, sir? I've, I've never had anybody play an intro for me of like a previous segment I've done on that show. So if it wasn't enough that we're Syracuse guys, you, me, and Ant, if it wasn't enough that Rachel is an incredible person who, who is making me like Craig even more for some reason, <laughs> I'd be like, this, this is, it's a conspiracy, man. It's, uh, it's good to be on with you, man. Uh, I appreciate that. And, uh, you know, I won't tell the journalism professors back at Syracuse that you're persuadable. <laughs> Yeah, this is the only time that, that you're getting me to be uh, biased, for sure. Yeah, uh, as long as it's biased towards the show, uh, then we'll take it. Um, so we've spent the first, much of the first uh, hour of the show talking about what is certainly the biggest order of business on the table for Josh Harris and his ownership group, which is the stadium. You've been covering that fairly closely for The Post, including some of the legislation making its way through Congress. Let's start off before we get into kind of the, the run of play specifically for RFK and DC, DC with what we learned over the last weekend uh, and obviously Thursday and Friday about the Harris group and how they're going to approach this. What did they say about not just what their priorities are, but who is going to be in charge of that process for this group? Yeah, so I think the first and most important thing is that Josh Harris said that the number one priority for them is fan experience and winning on the field. You know, those are, those are good lines for him, but I also think that they're true. Whatever you can do to upgrade FedEx, uh, however you can help the football team win more games. I think that's where you start. Mitch rails, uh, one of the minority owners obviously told my colleague, Mickey Jabala that he thinks that they might have to get out a clean sheet of paper and start from scratch. And so that would be a, a pretty significant um, step for them because Obviously, under Snyder, the commanders narrowed it down to, I believe, about half a dozen sites, you know, FedEx Part 2, RFK, Loudoun County, Prince William County. Um, those are some of the options on the table, but it sounds like they could, you know, start from scratch and, and start saying, okay, what are some suitable sites potentially in the DMV? And if they do that, um, I think the timeline gets a little bit longer than you might have expected. Right. So there's kind of a two-tiered timeline here, right? And that it's what's the new stadium and what can they do at the current one? I did think it was interesting. Like they had the super cheap concessions on Friday and I realized it was like a fan-friendly launch event. But what are the things that you think they could do and that you might even expect them to do, whether it's this season or next, to make the fan experience at FedEx better while they wait on whatever is next? One of the things that Josh Harris has talked about is ingress and egress, which is like the fancy business person term for like getting in and out of the parking lot. Um, the thing that they do, you know, I think the, the interesting thing to me is like that was Jason Wright's big thing last year and two years ago, ingress, egress, and talking about food and beverage and, you know, increasing the quality and making it more DMV specific. So it feels like more like a, a, an authentic cultural experience rather than just, you know, Johnny Rockets and a bunch of other national chains. So I think they have done some things in those regards. How much can the Josh Harris group do differently? I don't know. I'm kind of curious to see what they do. Like there's only so many ways you can organize that parking lot um, and, and the ways you can get in and out of it. Um, but so to me, it would be continuing on those things. I think the biggest one would be lowering beer prices, lowering concession prices. I don't know if they have the financial appetite or wherewithal to do something like that. But when I think one of the splash move that they could make in terms of fan experience, in terms of making FedEx better, those would, that would be my number one. Right. I think the, the one, a, that's one, a one B to me is parking. Like it is a bore and it's terrible. And there's only so much on your ingress egress, but like to go through the hell that is getting into FedEx field and then having to hand someone $50, like get out of here with that if they lowered parking to even 20 bucks like the the goodwill that would buy them in the fan base to me would probably be worth it um now that is a lot of money um that's uh, that that's obviously 50 to 25 or 50 to 20 i don't know what the averages are but if that's the case like that's over half your parking revenue but it is the kind of thing that snyder got crushed for years for just making a killing on the fact that you have to park it at FedEx Field. There's no alternative options, really, because the Metro is so far. There aren't any other lots around, like kind of off-site lots. And just just feeling like fans, or if fans feel like they're not being taken advantage of, I feel like that any place they can do that is a button that they should push. Yeah, absolutely. And so, like, I think the logical extension to that is, like, okay, what's one way to get ingress and egress better is, like, 
could we have, you know, a shuttle system, a, a quicker shuttle system from the Metro stop that's about a mile away from FedEx Field? You know, can we, what are the levers that we're willing to pull? How far can we go financially, but also logistically, just what are we capable of? If you set up, um, you know, kind of like they're doing for training camp, setting up an off-site gathering place where you can say, okay, the shuttle from here is free. I, I don't know what they're going to do, but I imagine that a lot of things are on the table um, and it's probably going to come down to, uh, you know, what the balance sheet looks like on that. Yeah, and uh, I think it's important to point out a lot of these are we, – we're about to find out what kind of ideas Jason Wright and his team have had the last couple of years that got said no to. Like, there's no way Josh Harris is coming in being like, I have all the, all the answers. They were just sitting here in this folder – because he hasn't been thinking about this for the last whatever number of years because he's been busy doing other stuff. I'm sure there's been a lot of ideas that that all kinds of people that worked at that organization have had that the Snyders were like, no, we're not paying for that. And now, you know, all of a sudden the checks are going to going to start coming through. So we'll see. Uh, Sam Fortier is with us here on the Hoffman Show. So that brings us to what's next. What is the state of play in D.C.? You've got the Congress's role, you've got the mayor's role, you've got city council's role. Let's start with Congress, because I know you wrote about that a couple of weeks ago. Where does this this legislation to free up RFK sit? So my colleague Megan Flynn and I reported that uh, James Comer, the, the House Republican, was preparing to introduce legislation that would get RFK, uh, that would extend and amend the lease at RFK, which would allow basically – um, Josh Harris to put a new stadium there in a mixed use development, which is currently uh, forbidden by the lease, putting a mixed use development there with retail and housing and things like that, that would, uh, you know, obviously make it a pretty feasible site. Uh, but that has not been introduced yet. And I think that's pretty notable because uh, on Friday, Congress is going to, to go in its August recess. So if you don't introduce it by Friday, you're then talking about September. And then at that point, you're going to start saying, hey, how many you know, days do we have left in the congressional calendar? What, what does the floor time look like? And, and it starts a, a very long process. So um, that is what we're looking for this week. Uh, you know, I think that they were um, trying to introduce it last week, but, but for whatever reason, it, it's held up. And so they're trying to introduce it this week. Um, but we'll see if they can get that accomplished. Okay, so that's Congress. That's the state of play there. The mayor's office is very simple, right? Bowser wants it, and as long as she's in office, then that's that's going to be rubber stamped if city council can get on board? Yeah, absolutely. But I do think it's notable, people should be aware, that, that Bowser wants this really badly. And we've discussed before that, you know, normally the person who would introduce this legislation is not a House Republican from Kentucky who has been messing with the city in terms of its crime bill legislation. It would be Eleanor Holmes Norton, the district representative. And so I think that the mayor, you know, working with, um, the team lobbyists who are up on Capitol Hill, them going to a House Republican is a pretty notable like way to circumvent the district's representative in Congress. So the mayor, yes, she's on board, but she's also played a, a pretty instrumental role in making this thing happen and, and going around Eleanor Holmes Norton. That is fascinating. And the reason she's doing that, from what I understand, is Eleanor Holmes Nol- Norton wants the city council to be 100% on board and the mayor to agree and everybody to be in a big giant kumbaya. Who are the the, the problem children, if you will, on city council, or if you're opposed to this, the heroes on city council that do not want uh, RFK used for football purposes? Yeah, the vocal opponents to that plan would be obviously the chairman, Phil Mendelson. He's been uh, out front, you know, pretty against it, saying that we need, you know, that we all need to see the report. They need to, the NFL needs to release the report into sexual harassment um, and workplace allegations. We, we actually don't know where Phil Mendelson stands on that following the, the release of the inquiry last week. Um, and that still might not change his mind because he has other reservations, including, you know, he believes that site needs to be used for affordable housing. And then the other one is, is Charles Allen, um, who his ward is actually, RFK is in his ward. Um, and he's probably the other most vocal opponent um, to the, the team there. So we've had five years now since uh, the or since DC United moved out of RFK. 2018 was the last time it was used for any regular purpose. Uh, now it's obviously fully dilapidated. Not that it really wasn't the last, I don't know, 10 years that it was in use, but it's fully dilapidated, fully out of use. Uh, occasionally people go in there for stuff and, it, you know, just you see these pictures of, you know, plant growth and all kinds of things over the seats. It's brutal. It's just a waste of space. So my question to someone like Phil Mendelson would be, what what kind of plan have you put forth? Because especially if a mixed-use type of site is put forth by Josh Harris, 
Do you think that will ultimately, you know, satiate what Mendelssohn and others want, that there could also be affordable housing and a reason for people to go to that that part of town and all the things that would come with a football stadium compared to just building another neighborhood in D.C.? Yeah, so, I mean, that is a pretty central argument, and, and I think Phil Mendelssohn has heard the mixed-use development before. I think there's, there's you know, multiple layers here. You know, Charles Allen has talked about there should not be any – any zero um, tax benefits to billionaires to help them build their stadiums. And, and that still would happen if the mayor went through with the Audi field plan to build Audi field for DC United, you know, that the city did horizontal work. They prepared the land, some of the infrastructure for, for DC United to come in and do the vertical work, put the stadium there. And so, you know, that is, that is the current proposal, what, what Muriel Bowser has talked about in terms of attracting the commanders. And I think that that even might be too much um, for Charles Allen. And I think that, uh, that, you know, when you talk about 190 acres, um, which is how big the RFK site is, Charles Allen, Phil Mendelssohn, and others have said, we need to use that for affordable housing. Um, and we need to use all of it, you know, a lot of it for affordable housing. But I think that the proponents of the, the commanders at the RFK site would say, whoa, 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 190 acres is a ton of land and we can do a bunch of stuff with that. And that is probably one of the central arguments. So that, that actually, Sam Fortier is our guest here on The Hoffman Show, gets us to a point that one of our callers made, which right now, although theoretically, the centralized location and the metro all sounds great. Like, the bottleneck on 295 would be a mess. Uh, the metro station is a dump. Like, it, it would just be super busy. Do you think that publicly funded or even with the Harris Group, like, be willing to pitch in on some of this? Like, there would be major infrastructure improvements around RFK if they, if they went through with this plan, right? Yeah, I assume there would be, and that cuts to the heart of sort of some of the things that, that pe- you know, some of the Harris group members said in my colleague Nikki Jabala's story, um, which the profile of Harris, which came out yesterday, which is, you know, Josh Harris really did stretch for this team. This was not something um, that I think that he could have come in and said, hey, I have a bajillion dollars like a Jeff Bezos. You know, this, this took some creative financing. It took a lot of, you know, partners to do this. Does Josh Harris and his group have the financial capability of doing all of the things that they would need to do to get RFK online and, you know, do it without city help, especially if you go to Virginia and Maryland and they are willing to give you taxpayer money, however that much, however much that may be. So, you know, I think we may have talked about this. I've talked about this with someone else. What is the line? Like how much better does, does Virginia or Maryland need to be, for the Harris group to say, okay, you know, we're going to give up on the dream of RFK. And we don't even know that, that that's the number one site, but to give up on the emotional appeal of RFK, what does the financial imbalance need to be? These are questions I think they're going to answer over the next few months. I think, I think we did talk about that at buddies. I just don't think we talked about it where anybody could hear it. So it's uh, <laughs> it good that we did that here on the radio. Uh, Sam Fortier is with us here on the Hoffman show. Um, all right. Last thing on this if, is there a place that you've heard rumored or one that's already on the list that you think would be an ideal spot for it, if not RFK? Like, there's such gigantic holes in the plans for so many of these sites. But if they're going to start over and, and have a blank sheet of paper, they hand you the paper and go, Sam, write a place down. Like, what's the, what's the place that you've heard that you go, I actually think that could work. That's a good idea. I understand the premise of the question, and I appreciate where you're going, but it was, it's hard to say something other than RFK because at the fan rally on Friday, in the middle of the mass of people, as Magic Johnson's about to talk, people just started chanting RFK. I think the fan base has made very clear that RFK is where they want to be. If, if they cannot be at RFK, I, I think that there's a lot – to like and dislike about sites in, in Maryland and Virginia. And I think the two that make the most sense are Loudoun County out by Dulles Airport um, and FedEx 2, which would be across the parking lot. I think that, you know, there, there are big downsides to both of them. There are big advantages. And probably the most, uh, you know, notable advantage in Loudoun County is the metro is right there. Um, there's space. And in Maryland, it's, you know, you can go across the parking lot. You already own that land. And Maryland, Governor Wes Moore is the only public official who has said that we are willing, that, that their jurisdiction is willing to put tax dollars on the table. 
Glenn Youngkin in Virginia has been much more reserved in saying this has to be right for Virginia taxpayers. And Virginia also has a lot of hurdles to jump through because if you remember in 2022, they basically have to pass a football stadium authority to fund any project. They want to give any taxpayer money to the commanders. They have to pass legislation. And man, (laughs) that is a lot of hoops to jump through, uh, especially because they can't bring up legislation until their next general assembly session, which starts in January. So there's basically Maryland, I know I'm rambling here, but Maryland is the only one with an executive who is saying we're going to give you taxpayer money and has the actual capability to do that. Makes sense. Uh, All right. Sam Fortier with us here on the Hoffman show on the way out, non Sam Howell category, your number one uh, commander's training camp storyline is offensive line. We, We did not see, them do very much in minicamp because it was a lot of passing and, you know, they weren't hitting each other uh, super hard. Anyway, Ron Rivera admitted that, you know, it's, it was hard to get a read on them, um, the offensive line particularly, and that's obviously a unit that, that hamstrung them last year. They, they had three problems last year, quarterback, coordinator, offensive line. They made, you know, big switches at two of them. Uh, they overhauled the offensive line a little bit, but uh, I, they didn't spend premium resources on it. So how does that offensive line look, I think, is going to be a huge question. Uh, have you had an Andrew Norwell gets released story in your drafts? <laughs> Man, I, I don't know when that's going to go. But I was yeah, going to say, if, if you do, it's time to hit publish. That just came down. So I'm going to let you go. <laughs> oh, 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 literally right now. <laughs> yeah, it just it just happened. So go go find that one in your drafts. Uh, send it. Make sure all, everything's spelled correct and uh, and hit publish. Andrew Norwell just got released. <laughs> All right, cool. Thanks, All right, guys. See I'll you later. Bye. Bye. That's, that's Sam Fortier, everybody. He's got work to do because uh, because Andrew Norwell just got released. That happened like 90 seconds ago. Uh, good good producing on that, Anthony. Way to get that uh, get that in front of me. Um, so, yeah, that's – that's. do we want to even hit the breaking news? I don't even know if at that point – this point, we don't even think we need the breaking news sounder. It's been – that's the only story that's taken as long as the, the sale – was Andrew Norwell getting released? Um, so now it's it's official. I guess he probably came in for whatever. They're probably like, "Hey, man, you don't you don't need to come in. It's good. You don't need to come back to DC." Uh, also, did you see that Trey Turner was visiting the Saints? Yeah, I did see that. Yeah, so big big day in former Commanders land. Those two guys are now. Are they the first former? Commanders, I mean Heineke too. Guys that were with Ron in Carolina, with him in Washington, and then gone. I mean Thomas Davis had the one year here. Yeah, I guess he was first because he was here year one and then he retired. You're, you're yeah. thinking you're in deep thought. Yeah, I'm trying. I'm trying to uh, think of some other more. I mean, some other uh, commanders. There's still some guys that are rolling. Fa still here, crushing it. Uh, David Mayo was with him in Carolina. People, people forget that. Yep. Um, any other notable Commanders? Curtis Samuel? Still here? Still kicking? Oh, yeah. So, just saying. Uh, Andrew Norwell, released. May his Commanders tenure rest in peace. Uh, I agree with Sam. The biggest storyline for sure, for sure, going into training camp this week is the offensive line. Um, it's multifaceted in terms of how we talk about it, but uh, I think that means we should talk about it. 301-230-0980 is the phone number. 301-230-0980. Non-quarterback division. What is the number one storyline going into Commander's training camp? We'll talk to you next here on the Team 980. Hey, this is DA, and you're listening to The Hoffman Show on the Team 980 and the Odyssey Edge. 